Bible, you can turn to Luke, the book of Luke today, and we're going to be in chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. And before we get there, I just want to tell you a story. Today, we're looking at a woman who grieved her only son. I'll tell you a story about a, a man who was in desperate need. He was down on his luck, and he was a handyman, and so he decided to wander over to a neighborhood that he thought looked like uh, there were some well-to-do people there. So he came up on one door and knocked on the door. And an elderly women, woman came to the door. And it turns out that her husband had just passed away and he was the handyman of the home. And he, was, he had just started a project which he really hadn't started. He only bought the materials and it was back on the back porch. And he said, ma'am, I could do that for you if you could just give me a little bit of money. She said, I tell you what, I'll pay you $500 if you go paint that porch. He said, yes, ma'am, thank you. And he went back to the back and he saw the supplies there. And so he just kind of taped everything off and fired up the machine, the sprayer and started spraying in no time flat. The guy was done. He came back up to the front door and knocked on it and said, ma'am, I painted your porch. Uh, and she said, uh, oh, thank you so much for painting my porch. And uh, so here's the $500. He goes, oh, by the way, ma'am, I hate to tell you, that's not a Porsche. That's a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what can happen when communication fails and intentions are misunderstood. Sometimes failing to misunderstand or understand a message can cost us dearly. And in the first century, it cost the Jews dearly. Because they misunderstood this one word. It wasn't porch. It wasn't a porch. It was the word Messiah. And they had been conditioned to think about the Messiah in a very narrow way. Of course they would. I mean, 500 years earlier, they had come out of Babylonian exile and they had been allowed to return to their land. And now they are in their land, their blessed land. But they're supposed to be independent and they're supposed to be the head and not the tail and nothing less. That's what the prophet said. But they're in Jerusalem. They're in Judea. They're in Galilee. And they're still under Roman oppression. They are a client state. So for them, they didn't feel like they were uh, out of exile or free from exile. They felt like they were still oppressed as a people. And so when they heard the word Messiah, they had one thing in mind. A political deliverer. A deliverer who would come... And set them free from oppression from a foreign state. And when Jesus came on the scene, he basically had to take them back to the Old Testament and remind them of all of the passages where they had screened out the fuller definition. And we're going to talk about that definition today. And they were at the tail end also of a religious revival that started with Ezra and Nehemiah. And man, it, what happened is what happens with every revival. It starts out just grassroots and sincere, and it takes off like a grass fire. And the next thing you know, it becomes institutionalized. And by Jesus's day, 400 or so years later, it was completely institutionalized and calcified in the religious leadership of the day. And it had become just an entrenched religious administration run by people who cared more about feathering their own nests than they did about the actual spiritual condition and climate of the nation and the people. But what these people haven't seen for a very, very long time, they have plenty of religious leaders, but what they have not seen is a genuine prophet. I mean, a genuine God sent anointed spokesman for God. Uh, they knew in their prophecies that the Messiah was supposed to come and he was supposed to be like Moses. He was supposed to be another deliverer like Moses. But Jesus has come not to just deliver them from Egyptian bondage or some kind of bondage. He has come to deliver them from their spiritual captivity. And they've heard about prophets like Elijah. And Jesus is like Elijah, except this time he's not confronting evil kings and queens. This time the Messiah prophet will confront the very powers of darkness in spiritual realms. Now, Jesus had just, in this story, ministered to a Roman. 
He had just ministered to someone who was off limits to Judaism. And he ministers to this Roman through a liaison, a party who comes to him. They're servants. And they come to Jesus and they say, oh, could you, could you please help us? The Roman centurion, his, his son is at home sick and Jesus gives the word and that child is cured. And now we come and Jesus decides that he's going to a place called Nain. And the story is in chapter 7, starting with verse 11. It says, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain and, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. So this is actually an entourage. This is a crowd that's going with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, underline that. And a large crowd from the town was with her. So this is one crowd traveling with Jesus that meets another crowd. This is fascinating. When the Lord Jesus saw her, his heart went out. That word is he was moved with compassion, and his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. And then he went up and touched the buyer with the pole of the casket that they were carrying him on. And the pallbearer stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And this news spread about Jesus, spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Nain was a town about six miles southeast of Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, and about a 25-mile walk from Capernaum, Jesus' home base of operations, ministry. It was a small pastoral town. In fact, the Hebrew word Nain, or Nain, means rolling pastures. It means beautiful country. That's what it means. And so it was just this very pastoral, beautiful town with rolling hills. But from Nain, from this very gate, you could look and see Nazareth. And what's so significant about that is that Jesus had just been rejected in Nazareth. Nazareth was his hometown and they rejected him as a prophet. And here he is in some town where he's either never been or they didn't know who he was and they receive him as a prophet. And what's more, he decides to crash a funeral. Anyone ever crashed a funeral? Yeah, I hope not. I've been at some funerals that have been crashed. Trust me, they're no fun. But Jesus crashes this family's funeral. And interestingly enough, from where he healed this man, you could actually look off in a distance and see the rest of Galilee, very many towns that Jesus ends up denouncing because they did not repent due to his message. And he finds a woman. He comes up the hill toward the gate And the sun is probably setting and he sees the silhouette of a woman who is shaking in grief because she has lost so much. She has lost her only son. A young man has gone. He he has died. I I spoke to a friend of mine a few few years ago and he, uh, unfortunately, they had lost their grandchild and his daughter-in-law had carried the baby almost full term. And when they got the call in Spokane, man, they, they said it was kind of iffy. You better get here fast, Dad. And they drove all the way to Portland. I mean, I think they did absolute record time from Spokane to Portland, Oregon. But when they got there, they discovered that, that the baby was lost. And when he came back, he went through a couple of... Uh, honestly, it was a couple of years of just grieving and grief just took a hold of him for a while. And I remember I was sitting for coffee with him and I asked him, I said, man, how are you doing? I don't want to pretend to know what you're going through. I don't have any advice. Are you okay? Are you getting along? He said, Jeff, I'm doing fine. I'm walking with God. He goes, but I, I got to tell you, of all the people in my life that I've lost, parents, people, I love, loved ones, nothing is like a loss of a child. Nothing. And, and this woman, that is what she is going through. She has lost her one and only son. And he's a young man, not a little boy. So he's able to work whatever family trade was her husband's. Now, she has lost more than the son. She has lost the husband. The Bible says she's a widow. So now, as a woman, she cannot inherit her home. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. This is injustice. This woman will bury her son today... And tomorrow, the Pharisees and scribes will come rapping on her door, 
to repossess her home and sell it and put the money in the temple treasury. It's a cruel, cruel and miserable scene of a despondent parent who now has nothing. And the text says Jesus was intensely stirred with compassion. This word that it uses for compassion is so intense. It is only used two times in the entire Bible. It's used once here, and then ironically, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the religious establishment, the religious leaders, did nothing to help the man, the Jew, who was beaten and left for dead and robbed. But the Samaritan comes along, who's the sinner, who's the half-breed, who's a member of a race that has corrupted and contaminated the Jewish faith, and he comes along and sees the man and has an uncommon mercy and compassion on him. That's the only other place this word is used. And Jesus then walks up to the buyer. He walks up to this open casket, and he stops it with his hand, and the funeral procession is halted. The mourners come to a hush. All eyes are fixed on Jesus, the prophet from Capernaum. And the text says, the young man, he spoke to the young man. Young man, get up. A picture that. The God who spoke worlds into existence, who spoke and particles of light came out of nothing. The word who was with God and was God from the beginning is now speaking to a dead corpse and telling him to rise up. And this young man, I can only use my educated imagination, this young man is probably off in paradise with Abraham at a feast, at a banquet somewhere spiritually, and he hears his name being called, and whoosh, just like that, he is back into his body, and just like that, his brain begins to fire electrical signals again. His heart thumps, and his ashen gray skin is flush, and he sits up, and the crowd is astonished. That's an understatement. Some in the procession can be heard shrieking in a kind of a holy terror, a holy panic. And maybe a few of them fainted. A prophet has given this woman back everything she has lost. And unlike Elijah, Jesus does not have to go and perform a ritual over her. He doesn't have to pray three times and, or ask the Father. He just speaks and it's done. He speaks and things move. So let me observe a few uh, principles if you're following along in your outline in your bulletin of grace for the brokenhearted in this story. Number one, Jesus goes out of his way to minister to the nameless, those with a grieving heart. Nain, beautiful town, nice place, but not by any means on the way to anywhere. Nain is out of the way. And Jesus on his trip probably got lots of suggestions as to where they should go. There are more exciting places to go, Jesus. There are places that are on their way to somewhere, anywhere else but Nain. You could go to Sepphoris. Jesus grew up probably working in Sepphoris. He only lived two, two and a half miles from there, so his dad, he and his dad probably walked back and forth every single day, and he probably helped in the Herodian construction projects that were going on there in his lifetime. And it was a, that was an exciting city. I mean, they had a wonderful Greek theater. I mean, you could, you could go and minister to some people, cast some demons out of some terrible pagans, and then go catch a show. <laughs> that would be fun. Or we could go to the Decapolis. The Decapolis was, that, that word means 10 city area. It means 10 cities. You could cross the Jordan to the east side of the Jordan, up toward the Golan Heights, and you could just go down and visit every city in the Decapolis and have a lot more fun. There's a lot to do there. It's architecturally very interesting. And Jesus says, nope. Today we're going to Nain. Say what? We're going to Nain. This would be like if Jesus were alive today, we would make all kinds of, of, and we were the disciples, we would make all kinds of suggestions to him. It's like, Lord, why don't we go to Seattle for the weekend and minister there? That would be great. Or maybe Salt Lakes, even Salt Lakes, a good, that's a good spot to go. Or maybe Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah, let's, let's go minister in Coeur d'Alene and then sit by the lake for a couple of days. And Jesus says, nope, today we're going to Preston, Idaho. Because I have heard that Napoleon Dynamite has fallen ill. <laughs> Just kidding. What's in Preston? Well, it's a nice town. It's in the top 10 places in Idaho to visit, but sort of toward the end of the list there. It's not on its way anywhere. 
And Jesus said, there's something that the Father wants me to do there in Nain. And I think the mess, there is a message here in this story about how much God cares for the grieving who feel obscure, who feel like no one else knows what they are going through. No one else in the world knows what the pain in my heart. When I was 14 years old, uh, my dad uh, was in a car accident, and I told all of you guys this, my dad was killed. And he was on his way to work on a Sunday morning. He was a recent convert to the faith. He was on his way uh, to work Sunday morning to put in a few extra overtime hours, and then he was going to meet us at church later. My dad uh, was met with an 18-wheeler, a semi-truck. He was in his 68 Camaro. And when that 18-wheeler crossed over the center line and hit my dad, it just disintegrated his car. Both drivers were killed on impact. And I remember after the funeral and after the sort of the family and crowd and all the people had just kind of gone away, I just remember... We got a knock at the door like two weeks later. And it was the pastor and his entire pastoral staff. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, the church was in the West End area of Richmond. It was West End Assembly of God. And I love that church for lots of reasons. The pastor was a powerful preacher. Man, he was an educated guy with his doctorate. And I was just drawn to that. And he was a powerful speaker, man. I was so pumped and just filled every time I sat on the front row and took copious notes on his sermons. But that's not the reason why I love this guy. I love Dr. Roden because he brought his staff from Richmond all the way out to Goochland. Now, Goochland is Nain. Goochland is the middle of nowhere. It's 35 miles out of town. He brought his whole staff. And they came into our house and sat in our living room and talked with us and comforted us and ministered and prayed with us. Man, I tell you, I'll never forget that. And when God called me to pastoral ministry and I got into ministry and somebody said, hey, uh, so-and-so's in the hospital, they're sick, I said, I'll go. And I've been doing that ever since. I just got to tell you that somehow in that moment, God put in my heart a desire to minister to people in their most traumatic times. And it just has always stuck with me. And our pastors are so good about this. We have a team of young pastors on staff here that will come and come and see you before I even have a chance to get the message. They're awesome. And we have a group, a team of elders and pastors, volunteer elder pastors who will do the same. And I am comforted and I am, my heart is warmed by the fact that so many of you have chosen to be caregivers. Let me tell you two things that burn pastors out. Can I tell you two reasons that I have noticed over the last 25 years why pastors quit churches and they, in fact, they leave vocational ministry altogether? The first one is uh, the in nitpickiness. That is com the complaints that just accumulate over the years. And it's never really one thing. It's death by a thousand cuts. And I have just watched this situation go on in the church for the last two decades where guys just get done with it. They can't carry it anymore. And they leave. They're just tired of carrying the complaints. And the other one is um, compassion fatigue. Guys get into pastoral ministry because they love people and they want to minister to people. And they may love preaching and they may love organizational leadership, do things I love too, but they want to minister to people. But no one ever taught them how to decentralize pastoral care. And what Jesus is doing in this text is showing the disciples, look, I'm not going to be here all the time. When I'm gone, the 12 of you are going to have to take this up. And then the 12 of you are going to have to equip 120. And then 120 will have to become 2,000. I am, my heart is warmed when I hear that some of you have ministered to hurting folks before I even had a chance to know about the story. I think of uh, Hope. Uh, I think of a, a lady in our congregation named Hope and her husband Don uh, Spitz passed away a few months ago. And I can't even begin to tell you how thankful I am that we had our joint heirs group that just converged on her and loved her. And you know what she said to me after the funeral? This is what she said to me. And now our pastors, elders, we were on it. We were there at the hospital visiting her, praying with her and Don, and walked them right up to death's door with Don. 
And here's what she said to me after the funeral. She said, I don't know what I would do without the people in this church. And I thought, there you go. You got it. My job is to equip you to minister to people. This is the heart of Jesus. Jesus goes out of his way. He will go all the way to Nain, the middle of nowhere Nain, to minister to grieving hearts. Amen. Something else about Jesus I think we see in the passage. Number two, Jesus' compassion is empathetic. It's empathetic. God is not content to merely omnisciently know about our human predicament. Now, omniscience comes from two words. Omni, meaning all, complete, and science, meaning knowledge. God is an all-knowing being. God is omniscient. God knows only in all truth values or truth propositions, and God holds no false beliefs. So God is omniscient. He knows everything that is true, and he doesn't know anything that is not true. God is omniscient, and he is not content to just omnisciently from heaven know about your situation. The doctrine of the incarnation is that God takes on human flesh and enters the human experience, and actually enters the experience of our suffering. This is why Isaiah described uh, the Messiah as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The Messiah is God as to his essential nature, but he is truly, really a human being who knows exactly what you're going through. He's been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. And from earth, God's son doesn't just sympathize with you, he empathizes with you. He enters your experience and he feels it because he knows it and he has been there. Hebrews tells us this, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us, but one who has become like us in all respects, yet without sin, sharing our humanity, entering our experience and our suffering. I love this quote by John Stott. He says, grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. This is God. Grace is love. This is God incarnate and fleshed in a human life. Grace is love that cares and stoops and condescends and comes down to our level and ministers to us in our limitedness and our finiteness. And he rescues. And this is the heart of Jesus in name. And this is to be the heart of his church for each other. Number three, Jesus' miracle is a reminder of God's resurrection power. I want to zoom in on something in the text that is so plain to see, but its obvious nature may cause us to overlook it, like mistaking a porch for a Porsche. People can come back to life. (laughs) People can come back to life. Why is this true? Dead people can live again because a dead person was never meant to be dead. You and I were meant to live with God in paradise forever. Now, how hard was it for God to create that first man? I don't even know what that looked like. Genesis tries to describe it. You know, like God getting down and, and, and sculpting this clay body. And then the naked man laying there lifeless. And then God respiring into his lungs, his nostrils. And he becomes this animate life. And then God laying his hand of endorsement on the man to say, you are my image bearer. You have my vocation. And this man is a body. He is a soul. He's a spirit. He's alive. He is an image bearer of God. How hard was that? Well, for you and I, that would be very hard. (laughs) But for God, it's a word. It's let there be. That's how hard it is. So how, how hard is it for God to reanimate a dead body that he's already created? Not very hard. God created that man in the first place. And the reason why resurrection is possible is because you and I were not meant to expire. We were meant to live forever. But now we live in the land of Nod. We live in the land of death. And death reigns in this world. Until someone raises from the dead forever, never to die again, and says, I can give you eternal life if you just put your hand of faith in mine. In our exile, we live in a world where we are surrounded by the spiritually deceased. Men and women who are dead in their sins, dead in their trespasses, and lost without God and without hope in the world. 
And this, this miracle of this young man in Nain, it reminds us that life wasn't supposed to be like this. Dead men live again because dead men can live again and they weren't meant to die in the first place. And in Christ, all who believe in Jesus' name for everlasting life will know resurrection life. Now, we don't know if this young man went on to do great things. I highly suspect that when he came out, came back into his body, I highly suspect he just kind of felt better than he ever had. And then he got right to work. Working his field or doing whatever his dad's trade was that had been passed on to him. We will never know his name until we get to heaven. And I'm sure he just lived out the rest of his life. And guess what happened? Guess what happened? His mom died at some point. It's 2,000 years later. She had to die at some point. She got sick or got a cold or maybe amoebic dysentery or didn't wash her hands and she died. (laughs) This is the ancient world. And then guess what happened to this guy? Maybe he got married and had some kids. Oh, it's wonderful. But he died again. (laughs) So his hope is not this resurrection. His hope is not this healing or this provision. His hope is the resurrection in Jesus at the end of the age. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, when you and I are resurrected with that spiritual body, we will be incorruptible. You cannot be corrupted. You and I, the, mor- the mortal body will put on immortality. And so what I want you to know from the text today is that when Jesus is on the scene, dead things can come back to life. And whatever has died in your life, whatever you are hauling out on a stretcher to bury and say goodbye to, I want you to know that God brings life where there was once death. God brings hope when all hope seems lost. And our ultimate hope is the resurrection from the dead And I know some of you are probably going through some very painful situations right now. I know that. Here's what I want to tell you. The resurrection is your hope. And that's not pie in the sky stuff, dude. I live right there every single day. And and let me tell you, by way of illustration, I had a friend and they couldn't have kids for many years. And I did not know that it was as heartbreaking. It shredded them. I also did not know that they had multiple miscarriages over that period of time. And he got a tattoo for every baby miscarried. And he carries it on his body, the physical symbols of those kids. And then one day they decided, we're going to adopt. And they just decided, God has called us to adopt. So they did. They, They got into the process of adopting this beautiful little baby girl. And while they did that, they also got pregnant. And so when they brought this little baby girl into their life, they had their little baby boy at about the same time. And, they, and if you saw them, you would think that they are fraternal twins. I mean, they just look, uh, they, uh, look amazingly similar. I don't know how they figured that out. And I was talking to him over coffee one day, and, he, and I was like, man, ha- has the, the day when you got your two little babies into your home, did it help the pain at all? He goes, oh, man, like you can't believe it. Just, it it's never gone. You never forget it, but it just washes the pain out in so many ways. And that is the way the resurrection will be. What Paul says is this, in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. On that day, when you and I are resurrected from the dead, the light and momentary afflictions that we encounter, experience in this world, oh, they won't compare. They will not compare to the glory of resurrection. And that's our hope. Number four, the crowd's response is accidentally orthodox. Talk about accidental Bible students. Jesus is a great prophet, and they're right about that. A great prophet is in their midst. He is the prophet foretold by Moses when Moses says, someday a prophet is going to come like me and he's going to deliver you just as I have. Jesus is that prophet. When Jesus shows up in Luke chapter 4, he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Today, this passage that we've read from Isaiah 58, Isaiah 60, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. I am that prophet. And then he says, I'm going to be just like Elijah and I'm going to the lost and I'm going to reach him. And then it says, they kicked him out of the synagogue, tried to kill him, and he said, what? A prophet is not accepted in his own hometown. Jesus is the prophet. 
He is God's embodiment of the prophetic office. But they're also right in the second half of it. When they say God is among us, God has come among us to help us, they're more right than they know. God the Son, the Lagos, from eternity, enfleshed in a human life, has come to do something hardly anyone at the time expected. Isaiah 53, 1 through 3 says this, Who has believed our message? Who believed what they've heard from us? Let's stop right there. Isaiah anticipated that when the Messiah would come, it would be difficult for people, for the Jews to get their heads around the message about the Messiah. He's God, the Son. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Don't you love the fact that your Lord and your God had no majesty in his physical appearance. If you line Jesus up in a line of Jewish guys, according to this prophecy, you would not be able to pick the Messiah out of that lineup. You wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to say, oh, that's the guy for sure. Aren't you encouraged to know that this Lord and this God who comes in the flesh was acquainted with sorrows and your grief? Aren't you encouraged to know that? That word acquainted just means accustomed to. He was accustomed to. He was conversant in it. He empathizes with us, not from the halls of eternity, but by coming and being one of us. Jesus goes to Nain, and they weren't wrong. He was the great prophet, and he is God among us, come to help us, come to save us. Will you pray with me? If you're sitting here this morning, and you don't know Jesus, and you've not had this transformation of mind and heart, deep on the inside, your heart is crying out for something more than religion has given you, something more than the world has given you. Well, you can receive it right now because salvation is a gift from God that you receive by faith. And if you would but, but open your hands and open your heart and receive it with the empty and open hands of faith, you can be saved today. Would you do it? Christ cares about you. Christ cares about what you're going through. He cares about the challenges that you're facing. And he wants to meet your needs, but ultimately, the answer is not him meeting this need. The answer is your resurrection with the Son at the end of this age. Will you receive him by faith right now? Just reach out. God, we confess our sins. We're sinners far from you, and we're headed for a Christless eternity, but you have done something about it. You sent Christ to die according to the scriptures, to be buried and raised back to life according to the scriptures, and we receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I hope you took the opportunity to do that. I want to leave you with a resource. I don't often do this, but this one I do. My friend Kurt Bubna uh, wrote a book the book is called Epic Grace. Absolutely wonderful book. I, I hope you pick this up on Amazon. It's called Epic Grace. The subtitle is Chronicles of a Recovering Idiot. And I resonate with that. And there I have some favorite chapters in here. And I went back and read them over the last couple of weeks. And what I want to encourage you with today is no matter how much you feel like you've blundered, no matter how wayward you feel today, no matter how much you felt like you gave it the old college try and you swung as hard as you could and you came up short, God has more grace for you than you can imagine. God has more grace for you than you even know. His grace is epic grace. And for all of us fellow recovering idiots, we all say amen. 